O be joyful in the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Be ye sure that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. O go your way into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and speak good of his name, for the Lord is gracious. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth from generation to generation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How are you doing, Baron? And uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and good night, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, peace be with you guys. Uh, just as the, the room fills up, uh, I'll let you know what we're doing today. We're going to do some Lenten reflections. Then we're going to do um, some radical questions and then just sort of general discussion. How are we doing today? Um, so I hope you guys are well. Um, obviously, as I'm doing the Lenten reflection and the, the setting up the radical question, I won't be interacting with the chat. But in the meantime, peace be with you, Alberto. Um, I hope you guys are well. So I wanted to um, start off um, just by um, talking a little bit about Lent, because we are in the midst of Lent now. Um, Lent is underway, and we're soon going to be joined by all our Orthodox brothers and sisters around the world who, following their abhorrent and cosmologically flawed calendar, will be joining us um, in the practice of Lent very shortly. God bless you guys. Um, it's a, an in-joke amongst Christians about the calendar thing. It's not a real slight against them. Um, how are we doing, Daniel Apologetics, the great and the mighty? Good to see you, bro. I'm looking forward to the day that I can come out and see you. Um, by the way, guys, if you have not subscribed to um, Daniel Apologetics' channel, please do so. Uh, he's putting up some great stuff. He's doing great things. Um, so, you know, please do... Uh, follow him. He, he's, he's an upcoming star in the whole um, apologetics YouTube world. So I want to start by talking about Lent. And Lent is obviously a time when Christians reflect and think. Um, <clears throat> to reflect and to do the sort of inner renovation work that we're meant to be doing with regards to our souls. Um, let me just straighten that out for you guys because that's annoying me. Um, setting off my OCD, that is. Um, anyway, not that I've sorted that out, but um, certainly John, but not just yet. Um, so in terms of in terms of the um, Lenten reflection that I want to ask is that as Christians, um, well, as human beings, when we meet someone for the first time, we give them social capital. You know, we give them the benefit of the doubt. We give them a chance to use the common parlance in the way that we describe it. Um, and in terms of the social, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm going to talk about that as the social capital um, or grace. You know, we give them a, a, an amount of grace, a deposit of grace to begin with. How are we doing, Claudia? And the, how are we doing, I believe? And the idea of it is that as we, as we, we meet someone for the first time, we, we give them this allowance to see what they do with it and, you know, to see if we like them and if they like us. And, and then from that, we, we can develop our friendships. Now, what I want to talk about as a Lenten reflection is, is how, how open are we to uh, other Christians on account of the fact that they are Christian? Now, when we meet a new Christian, very often we do exactly the same thing that we do with anyone else. We give them a certain allowance, a certain uh, pay, uh, forward payment of social capital to see what they should do with it. And, and, and very much our attitudes instinctively reflect what we do normally in the world with um, people who aren't Christians. But I... I, I 
I think one of the things that happens in Sunday club churches is that we um, we we very much end up creating cliques and friendship circles um, precisely because we're operating in the church like we do in the world. But then those that fall out, because so we home in on people like ourselves. We home in on on people of a similar age group, a similar demographic, a similar professional outlook. And you see this in Sunday club churches. Um, and, you know, and I think one of the, the benefits, one, one of the things that comes out of a Christian identity is that there we start from and this is a genuine fruit that, that I've experienced in my life. When you know, I've lived in lots of different house shares over the years because you know I can't afford to, to live in my own place, or so I've constantly had to live with other people. And just to let you guys know, I'm getting a warning that my internet's a bit shaky. So if I disappear, I'll be back. But I've lived in lots of different house shares, and I've noticed that when you move in with non-Christians. In my experience, the um, the social capital that you get is a lot less, and it's much more quickly used up. When I've lived with Christians in house share, I feel that in my experience that there's more social capital. It get you it gets used up less because the, it gets used up over a longer time because there are are less um, less people. Um, sorry, there's there's more grace, there's more forgiveness. Um, it's but it gets used in the same way. And one of the things that I want to encourage um, the uh, reflection for us to do is to ask ourselves: How open are we to our brothers and sisters in Christ? Are we approaching church from the attitude of um, it's a club in which I can build a social network or are we um, approaching church with the attitude that we are a people group we are brothers and sisters we are comrades in the same army um, we're pilgrims together on the same journey um, working from that kind of narrative to helping one another and and supporting one another in terms of our um in terms of our pilgrimage how much are you willing to give as a deposit in social capital to the other christian that you meet whenever you meet them how willing are you to develop relationships with Christians regardless of any other factor, regardless of class, regardless of race, regardless of age, regardless of gender, and there are only two genders, regardless of sexuality, regardless of, because there are celibate homosexual Christians, regardless of um physical ability how much social capital do you give immediately when you meet someone who is a christian and i, I think this is a, a good reflection for us to do there's there's lots of reflections that we could do but since we're in lent and you know i, I felt it would be a good one for us to do and to reflect upon how much we are willing to give of ourselves to other christians in sacrifice like how much are we willing to pay down and to commit to our relationships with our brothers and sisters so that's that's one of the reflections that um i'd really want to invite you guys to think about and i want to encourage you guys who are not doing the you know the great campaign of lent this great cause of Lent to start tomorrow, to start tomorrow, to, to get onto the fasting, to get onto the prayer, to get on the almsgiving, to get onto that waging war against yourself 
your inner habits, to do that self-examination and that reflection, to think about uh, and, and use this time of Lent to really see about where you need to readjust your life, to recenter your life, to reorganize your life. So that, that that's one of the Lenten reflections. Um, John, I think you said you wanted to ask a question. Um, so can do you want to um, ask a question? What what is the question? Um, what I'll do, guys. Um, I'm going to put out. I'm going to release the the thing, the the link to to come in. Uh, and the first person that I want to invite is the guy that said he wanted to ask a question, which I believe was John. Um, I think it was John. Yeah, you want? Yeah, it was you, John. You wanted to ask me a question. Now's your chance. Um, and while he's either typing that question out or clicking on the link, um, uh, yeah, guys, like take time to reflect about how are you living out your faith socially? How are you living out your faith economically? How are you living out your faith politically? How are you living out your faith? Um, I think that's the question. So if you just bear with us, I'll come back to it. How are you living out your faith politically? How are you living out your faith in terms of where you spend your time? How are you living out your faith in where you spend your money? How are you living out your faith in where you um, where you um, how, how you treat your body? How are you living out your faith in where you spend your emotional energy? Like it, it really, these are really important questions for us to dig deep on and to do self-examination upon. Uh, and I, I really want to encourage you guys to do it. And, you know, I, I, yeah, so there you go. Okay, guys. So um, I'm not doing strictly a Q&A as I normally would. So if you bear with us, guys. Um, I just want to deal with John's question because I said I would. Um, I watch a video in Blogging Theology channel. The Trinity was added later on to the Bible. Well, I mean, bro, it, the, the chances are what, what um, Blogging Theology, otherwise known as Paul, is talking about is um, 1 John 5, 7, which is known as the Comma Yohanan. But the reality is, as Paul knows all too well, um, and simply chooses to ignore, um, Christians believed in the Trinity long before the insertion of the Comma Johannine. So 1 John 5, 7 is an, an extremely late insertion into the text that only appears in the third edition of the Novum Testum Grecum of Desdiri Erasmus in the 1500s, and then the English translations that are derivative from that. And it also appears in some um, Latin Vulgates. But beyond those, those lines of transmission, the Comma Johannan does not appear in any other texts. It is something that, that, that had crept in from a commentary note from one of the church fathers. Who, who who wrote a commentary on this and used those phrases and then a copyist um, put it into the margins and then another copyist thought that it, it was not a commentary written into the margin but rather something that needed to be put into the text and so it found its way into the text. But the thing is Christians believed in the Trinity long before this, long before any of these things. Um, and so you know this this idea that the trinity has been added john is pure myth making nonsense and mischief by blogging theology and people like him um the the trinity existed it's it's found in the new testament i've defended the trinity in multiple debates from the new testament um i've never had to use the the comma johannan um, it were, the Trinity was believed even before the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople. It's there in the church writings of the church fathers. So 
it, it's simply myth making nonsense and it's really important hugely important guys that you, you that you learn your history stop letting other people teach you your history john i, I it troubles me that you're troubled by this because this tells me that you don't know your history because anyone who knows the history of the faith would laugh at this claim would laugh at it so it's really important christians that you learn your history because if you don't learn your history if you don't tell your history then other people will tell your history for you okay so i hope that answers your question john so um <clears throat> so i just just to let you know um boy plus and others that have tried to um come into the studio i had actually put out the link um for john to come in to ask a question but you guys and anyone who wants to are allowed to come in on the section that we're going to do on um radical questions um but I, i'll i'll just do a few questions before we go into the radical question talk so let's have a look what do you, again uh, i'll only i'll only do stuff that's sort of directed towards me um if there is anything but it doesn't matter if there isn't because okay yeah we've done that one let's have a look um these kinds of comments are quite unnecessary like i won't worry about it guys it's not about the number of views people will watch in their own good time um i think some guys get their knickers in a twist about not very much um let's have a look okay so i one of the, one of the things that i want to invite you if you want to come on from the link that I'm about to share, what I'd like to invite you to come on and to share what kind of questions you are asking yourself this Lent. You know, it may be that you're thinking of a kind of question that no one else is thinking about. So if you've got a question that you're asking yourself this Lent, then uh, please do. Um, uh, I've got Boy Plus here. If I remember who Boy Plus is, um, then we'll see if he stays on topic. Um, if not, I will just end up having to ask him to leave again. Um, how are we doing, Boy Plus? Yeah, I'm all right. Good. Um, what what kind of questions have you been asking yourself this Lent? Yeah, uh, the kind of the the question I'm asking myself is uh, uh, it's just a logical question. I have two question. I have one question that I'm asking myself and the one question that i will ask you direct the first question is this uh when when we die what kind of body our spirit also the kind of body god we give our spirit at the last day also those that uh those that uh, inherit the the everlasting life also the kind of body is it this physical body we have now or will it be another form of body that, that is one spiritual question i'm asking myself and i need help so if anybody can help me with that and okay the, so boy plus let's, question, let's boy plus boy plus boy plus let's just do that question first um just so you know guys what what i'm talking about when i talk about lenten questions and perhaps i didn't make this um clear enough i'm talking about the, the kind of questions that are based on the self-examination of the soul the kind of questions that are based upon how you are improving your discipleship so those are the kinds of questions that I'm looking at. But since I didn't explain that before Boy Plus asked that question, I'll address Boy Plus's question. In terms of my understanding of the scripture, what we've got is a body that is a combination of both spiritual and physical, which at this moment in time, the physical is the dominating factor of that body and the spirit works through and in the body whereas what happens at the resurrection is that it becomes a spiritual body it still has the physical there it's still physical it's it's it, it still is a physical body but the spiritual is the dominating factor and so it will be able to do and to exist in ways that the physical body cannot 
in the same way that at the moment the spiritual body restricts the sorry the physical body restricts the abilities of the spiritual body after the resurrection the spiritual body will be able to do things that the physical body could not do at this moment in time and my example for that is obviously the resurrection of our lord jesus christ who himself was able to do things in his spiritual resurrected body that um, he, he didn't do um, when he was um, just a, a physical body. So um, I hope that addresses your question. Now, your second question, Boy Plus, is it is it about a Lenten question? No, I'll be honest to you. It's about a comment you made about, uh, you, you said, uh, homosexual uh, Christians. Yeah, yeah. There's there, there are Christians that have homosexual feelings that are celibate. Yeah, that, so my question is this, uh, why are we Christians creating that loom of, you know, creating that loom in, inside our, our Christian family, you know, making a loom for homosexual people, you know, to me, I think everybody is fearful, homosexual or no, because homosexual is a way of life to me. It's a way of it's a it's a it's a way of life to me. So if someone is homosexual or being a Christian, uh, me being a Christian, he don't know. Nobody knows what the way of life you know how I'm living my life. You know, I think making that room inside Christian family, you know, is is it, it doesn't worth it. I mean, everybody should be equal. The kind of life the person is living is private to that person. We should not bring it into Christian family. So well, let, let's let's just let's just I'll, I'll address that. But then I, I'm going to invite people to come on and talk about Lenten questions. I recognise that yeah, I brought you yeah. in and I didn't I'm make sorry, that clear. I'm sorry, so, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That's fine. I, I didn't I didn't make it clear enough at the beginning, so that's my fault. But in terms of in terms of the question of homosexuality. W w no thinking person could deny the fact that people that there are people out there with homosexual attraction. That's the fact. It, it's undeniable. I, I am utterly convinced that they don't get a choice in this. It's in the same way that I don't get a choice in being heterosexual. There's no money on earth or no events on earth that could make me uh, feel attracted to um a guy in the same way that I would feel attracted to a girl. And I, I don't see any reason rationally to think that it's any different for someone who's got a homosexual feeling. Um, but, but obviously the practice of homosexuality is completely incompatible with the Christian faith. It's just a no go. It can't be done. Um, and so those particular Christians have that, that, that a uh, particularly special, hard cross to bear in the same way that someone who's born paraplegic has a particularly hard cross to bear or, or, or countless other people that are born in, in countless other ways that they can't affect or change. They, they, you know, it, they, they have a cross to bear. It, it's their cross. Um, and what we need is a, a culture that embraces the idea of carrying your cross um, and, and one that supports homosexual Christians who are trying to be celibate um, and, 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 and seeking to encourage them and support them in their celibacy in the same way that we should be encouraging and supporting single people who are not married to be celibate and, and to be, um, you know, and, and to put my hand on my heart and, and to, you know, for, for the sake of all clarity, that, that was that's something I failed in. You know, um, so that that's something that we need to address because there's a lot of sexual sin happening in the church. Yes. And we need to we need to be real about that. And that starts by a everyone being able to go, look, you know, I, I, I failed in my sexual um, vocation, whether that to be to celibacy or whether that to be in marriage and then to work from wherever that particular person is to go forward um some of the deepest sins that i'm tackling are, 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 are questions connected to sex so we as christians need to to do that um 
and it's got to be it's got to be an environment in which people can feel that they can talk about it and unfortunately uh, lots of our churches and our fellowships are very prudish about questions about sex you know they blush when you mention the word they can't talk about it they won't talk about it and when they do talk about it they often talk about it in a way that is very immature um, very sort of legalistic um, in ways that are not particularly useful or helpful to anyone because they don't deal with the real humanity that is involved in sexuality. Now, that isn't to say that I'm seeking to have a permissive culture within the church. I'm, I'm certainly not. Homosexuality is not compatible. Homosexual practice is not compatible with Christian teaching. Sex outside of marriage is not compatible with Christian teaching. So the you know it's kind of like, but we we've we've got to be frank and we we've got to we've got to deal with where we are. You know you can't make saints by by um, by living in fictitious imaginary categories or you know simply positing the fact that you know you shouldn't do this as a christian or you shouldn't do that as a christian doesn't actually necessarily help someone achieve that sense of self discipline in which they can then abide by that that codification by that um by that standard so i hope i hope that makes sense boy plus to your question forgive me i'm not looking to a debate on it um i, I want to fo focus back in on the lenten thing I, I can i can i can i can understand i can understand yeah but uh, you just uh, highlight a very big point you know that allows me to to be stable on on my thoughts you know that there is no way uh, the church is no way the church is uh, advocating such a, an act. So, and thank you very much for that. Okay. Anyway, God bless you, Boy Plus. Um, feel free to come back in if you've got yeah. questions connected to Lent. Um, I'm, you're more than welcome to join the back of the queue. Uh, let's have a look. So, guys, what are the Lenten questions that you're asking yourself? The kind of questions of self-examination, the kind of questions of in self-interrogation, the kind of um, areas perhaps that you're reflecting upon in terms of your spirituality. You don't have to do some self-confession about what you've discovered. Uh, I'm, I'm simply in inviting you to share your um, the kind of questions that you're asking yourself in terms of your Lenten practice. Um, so while people are um, hopefully reflecting on that, um, uh, please do join the studio, um, and then we'll 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 let you in to to share with what you're thinking. Um, some news from me, or for my part, um, I will um, be having a debate soon um, with um, Sikari on Soko Films with regards to soteriology. Uh, that's coming up next month. And also on Soko Films, I'll be doing an interview to talk about um, um, Christian politics and uh, the Christian political narrative and why we need it, because that is something that we desperately do need to, to be thinking about as Christians. Um, and then also, if you haven't seen it already, I, I did a, a live stream with Somali Christian TV um, looking at where does um, Jesus call himself God. It's a really good live stream, even if I say so myself. Forgive me for blowing my own trumpet. Um, but it's fantastic if you are looking for where does Jesus call himself God in the New Testament? Where does the New Testament call Jesus God? really go and have a look at that live stream and do support the Somali Christian church. Um, you know, it really is a, 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 a community that needs our support. Um, there's things happening in the Somali community and we should be happy about that. And we should try to build it as much as possible. Um, okay. So I will try to be restrictive to questions about Lent. 
Um, and since this is a question about Lent, I thought I would talk about it. Um, what is fasting? Skipping one or two meals a day or should not eat and even put anything in the mouth for an entire day. What does the Bible say about this? So in, in terms of fasting, there's different models of fasting in the scriptures. So there is the kind of Esther fast where you know, there's a, 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 a like a special thing that we need to implore God for. And we go without food and drink for a very short amount of time, a day, two days, um, you know, that, that kind of thing. So you cut out all food and drink for a block of time. And certainly at the beginning of Lent, traditionally, um, Christians would go for two days without any food at all in the first two days so it'd be like two and a half days without any food um and then the first time they would eat um it would would be about the the the, the third and a half day sorry the 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 yes the 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 half half day mark of the third day um after the, they've received the ashes because particularly within the orthodox church they would start on a monday whereas in the roman rite they started on a Wednesday um, and then on Good Friday would be again a, a sort of day where you go without any food, any drink at all. I know I know Pentecostal Christians who do this, you know, they'll have a, a when, when they call to fast, uh, sometimes they'll, they'll do a fast for a day without any food or any drink for one whole 24 hour period. So that's one kind of fasting. But obviously that is the most intense form of fasting and it's very, very short. There's also the kind of fasting that I think we, we see in Davidic uh, times or within the writings of David, where you, you they cut out certain foods. So they would cut out certain foods um, and, and not eat other foods, essentially going vegan. Um, and that is what Christians do during Lent. We fast by going vegan and Traditionally, Christians would f go without any food or drink up until a certain hour in the day, which traditionally was three o'clock um, in the afternoon. Um, but obviously, and bearing in mind, in agricultural times, you would be rising with the dawn. So actually fasting until three o'clock was quite a long fast, but obviously times have changed. And now most people get up around seven, go to work at nine. And if you're breaking your fast at three, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's coming from an agricultural world um, when you'd be ra rising with the dawn. Um, but you can go above that or below that. So, for instance, I fast until a different hour in the day. It's later than three, but it's it, you know, so you don't have to stick to three. And if you have if you have other kinds of, you know, other reasons, perhaps health reasons connected to diabetes, there may be reasons why you wouldn't fast until three, you'd bring that back. The, the point is that you can, you do as much as you can do. So going vegan is exactly what it sounds like. Um, and if you really want to be really hard on it, then it'll, you also go without cooking oil of any description and any alcohol as well. Um, now, all of these rules get relaxed at the on a Sunday um, so you know like uh, yeah so so on a Sunday it's a day of celebration a day of the resurrection so often your your Lenten commitments will relax on a Sunday to signify the fact that we are celebrating the resurrection because um, the, the the Sunday is always a day of celebration for Christian so in terms of in terms of the, the that that kind of fasting you have that Lenten fast other kinds of fasts are, are as you know the Roman Rite currently you know has this really kind of weak discipline of this idea of um, you know having one meal a day with two small snacks now that 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 depending on how you do that, that could actually be quite hard. Um, if your small snacks are actually really small, they're not meant to even together equal another meal. But so that is implied. So if you're just having one meal a day, then and and, and not like the Muslims do, where they glut out. You know, I'm talking about a normal sized meal. So whatever a normal size meal would be when you're not fasting, that's the size of the meal that you have when you are fasting and you just have that one meal a day. That's really hard. Um, you can have the meal whenever you like, 
but the thing is you don't get to eat again for another 24 hours so you know that that's another way of fasting um so you've got to you've got to de you've got to decide what lenten commitment works for you um the point is for us as Christians, we're not we're not earning brownie points with God. It's not like we're winning some favor with God because we're fasting in the sense of we're chalking up the good marks in his good books through this fasting. That's not how it works. The fasting is to discipline ourselves. The fasting is to separate our our desires from the world and to to elevate the will over the flesh. It, that's the kind of spiritual disciplines that are at the heart of um, Christian fasting. Um, and so you, you, then you've got Jesus as fast. The Christ himself said, when you fast. So this is not an option for those who call themselves disciples of our Lord. You don't get to not fast as a Christian. You have to fast. Um, and so, you know, but but. You don't have to follow the church calendar of fasting. You know, you're not less of a Christian if you decide that you're not going to fast in Lent, but you'll fast at another point in time. The point is that you have a regular rhythm of fasting in your life, like you have a regular rhythm of prayer in your life. Um, and so whether you're following a, a church calendar of fasting, the traditional forms of fasting, or whether you're following a, a different rhythm of fasting that either you have come up with or your own particular fellowship have come up with, which is different from the wider Christian community, these things don't really matter. It's obviously better if we share the experience of fasting. And so I really, really do hope that Christians get back into fasting in a big way, so much so that restaurants start putting out Lenten menus you know, putting out extra options during Lent in recognition of the fact that it is Lent, like they do in places like Greece, for instance. You know, it is by being a cultural body and expressing our faith culturally that we evangelize the culture. And I'm actually confident that, that Lent is going to make a comeback in our culture because once all the little village people at the top of the tree who, who make all the decisions for us and tell us what to think and what to say, recognize that Lent actually would, Lent and Advent would get people to be um, vegan for ne neon um, 80 days of the year then then that fits with their agenda of getting us all to go vegan anyway. So I actually think that they'll start pushing um, Lent and Advent to serve their agenda um, and commercializing it. Um, so I actually expect Lent to make a big comeback. So if it does happen in the next 10 years, you heard it here first. Um, and if I'm wrong, you can come back in 10 years and tell me I was wrong. So I hope that answers your question, um, true stranger. Um, uh, how do I get this off? Uh, so um, I'm, I'm going to change tact as no one has, has jumped in on the, the question that I wanted to, to ask about. Um, in fact, what I'll do is I'll, I'll take Q&A for a bit and then in the second hour, I'll, I'll, I'll change tact again. Um, so let's just see what other kind of questions. I will obviously uh, be biased towards any questions that are connected more towards Lent. Um, Okay, let's have a look. Uh, Bob, there is no evidence that God took a form of a man to come to earth to save all sinners. Sins can be illustrated differently in different religions, e.g. to one religion doing one sort of bad thing. Um, Android, clearly you've never read the New Testament, sir, um, because the, the scriptures are very clear that um, God takes human form. It, it says it literally in the Gospel of John. I'll just read it to you because you're claiming that there's no evidence. The evidence is in the New Testament. This is the testimony of the apostles that knew the Lord Jesus Christ. And this was their experience of the man. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that was come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So that's John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. So we've identified that the Word was in the beginning with God, and the Word was everything that God is. So everything that, that makes God God 
the word is also that. That's what it means when it says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The the logos uh, and theos in the in the first verse section C, i.e., that he was in the beginning with sorry, um, the word was God. That that statement, the OS in logos, <laughs> OS, you, you you get what I mean. The the ending of the logos and the ending of theos means that these two words are describing one another. Theos is describing Logos and Logos is describing Theos. So the word is divine and the divinity is the word. So whoever the word is, is God. And then when you go down in John chapter 1 in verse 14, it says the word. So we're talking about what was spoken about in um, verses one to five, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the father, full of grace and truth. So we've the, the, it's saying that the word has become flesh. Now, the the word is then identified as Jesus Christ. So this claim that there is no evidence that God took the form of a man is completely ridiculous. It, it's testified to in historical documents. The historical documents are of the writings of the Apostle John. So I'm afraid that your statement just um, demonstrates your ignorance of this claim. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know what perspective you're coming from. Um, but there is certainly evidence that God took the form of a man. Now, whether you believe that evidence is an entirely different question. But to say that there is no evidence is just demonstrably false, as we took me all of two minutes to do that. Anyway, moving on. Uh, let's see if there are any other questions. Um, let's have a look. What's this? Bob, the builder, we have a troll. Uh, John blaspheming. Well, I haven't seen John blaspheme yet, um, and I am not in control. Okay, so here we go. Um, John says that the Trinity is polytheism. So I'm going to give an invite to John, and if he doesn't accept it, I'm going to block him. So here you go, John. Here is your invite to come on and to show me, prove to me and to all of my audience that the Trinity is a belief in three gods. Um, if you don't take me up on that offer, within the next, I will give you a few minutes to, to click on the link that I've put down there. But if you don't click on that offer, I am simply going to block you. So, and, and this is the thing, guys. When I'm, when I'm going to assume, and I could be wrong, um, I could be wrong, but I'm going to guess that John is a Muslim. Uh, John, feel free to come and correct me if I am wrong. But my simple question is to anyone who says that, here's my Bible. Take me to the passage that tells me to believe in three gods. Please. I mean, I believe in this book. This book to me is sacred. Anyone with a brain would recognize that I genuinely want to believe what this book teaches. So if this book teaches me polytheism, I guarantee I will be a polytheist. But it doesn't teach me to believe in polytheism. So, you know, it's on you to show me where the Bible teaches me to be polytheistic and I'll be polytheistic. But it doesn't. It teaches me monotheism. And so I am monotheistic. And simply saying to me that I am a polytheist just demonstrates that you're a troll and that you're deeply ignorant. Now, I don't know how long, guys, you think I should give John a go. He's still not come. I just want to put out the link again. John, are you there? Here's your chance not to get blocked. All you have to do is come on and show me where the Bible teaches that I'm a polytheist. Please. Um, come on, John. What's wrong with you? you, you were, you're you brave in the chat. Why aren't you brave all of a sudden um, in person? You know, and this is the thing with these trolls. They, they come into the chat. They, they break it up. Um, 
So, John, um, are you are you coming, or are you just another uh, Islamist coward who trolls comments and is un and is afraid to debate the points that you make? You're saying that the Trinity is polytheism. I want you to show me where the Bible teaches me to believe in three gods. Can you do that, John? And he can't, can he? Like, uh, guys, just just. If you feel that I've waited long enough for John, could you put a one in the chat? If you feel that I need to wait a bit longer for John, could you put a two in the chat? And depending on what number you put into the chat, I will either block John immediately or I'll give him a few more minutes um, to come in. So, John, are you coming in? Yeah, I'll, I see you. I'll let you on shortly, bro. I'm just waiting to decide whether we're, we're, we're putting John on trial here. John the troll. Um, I need you to vote, guys. You need to. There's 75 of you, and only a handful have voted. I need you to vote. Put in a one or a two. One, if you think that I have waited long enough for John to come and debate this question. Two, if you feel that I haven't waited long enough, and I should wait a little bit longer for John. We're not going to talk about anything else until I've got a clear vote, guys. Please put in a vote. One or two, please. Um, so far, all the votes are one. There we go. Now people are responding. Thank you so much. Okay, John, I'm afraid your time with us is up. I am going to block you because you are a coward, sir. Okay, John is blocked. Right, John is gone. He'll probably come back with another fake uh, profile because that's just what John does. He loves to troll. Um, I don't know how to get that off the screen now, so I'll just click on someone else's thing. There we go. Right, let's in Al. Al, I have no idea why you clicked on the link, so you'll have to let me know, bro. What is it you, 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 you're coming in on? Okay, I think, I think Al is like massively behind. In terms of his his the delay on him, Al, can you hear me? Yeah. Right. So, um, what 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 you clicked on the link for, bro? What do you want to talk about? No general, maybe general reflection, and uh, maybe as I was reading your blog on 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 soldiers of Christ, where we should develop a muscular faith, right? Mm. And maybe somewhere, yes. If you if if you think of maybe Christianity, we have softened it after some time. In the way that maybe we should go deeper in knowing our faith, you know, and maybe passing that knowledge on to to children. Uh, maybe so recently, I've been trying to to maybe uh, uh, gain more knowledge, you know, on on on, on our faith, you know, more more background. Mm. And I've noticed, for example, uh, learning Greek. And learning Hebrew to understand, maybe understand better the meaning of the scriptures, that really helps. But that's something that usually, you know, most of of Christians countries, they they don't they don't used to do. I don't know if that that makes sense. Well, so, yeah, I think I think there is a, a I think there's a real problem of of ignorance within the church. Ignorance seems to have become this prized thing. Um, among certain groups of Christians. And I think the reason for that is, is numerous. There's never one reason. So that, that was a bad start. But there's there's one of the reasons is that it suits the pastors if the congregations are ignorant. Um, because uh, lots of the ways that we do church just, just aren't particularly Christian or they could be better. And I mean, particularly the club kind, the Sunday club kind of Christianity, is not what what Christianity is meant to be. Um, we're, we're meant to do church as a society, as a people group, and also the fact that 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 I think sometimes because we are such a disorganized community at the moment, um, w w because of denominationalism and sectarianism, yeah. that. That what that, that in some ways a, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing, and and what we end up with is is Christians who've um, got a little bit of head knowledge, but not necessarily done a lot of the spiritual development, and then 
they suddenly think that they're the next, um, you know, Irenaeus or the next John Christosom, and they end up trying to do damage. They end up doing damage within the church because they become inflexible doctrinaires, not realizing that discipleship is about the growth of the whole human being emotionally and intellectually. It's socially, politically, economically, spiritually, you know, and, and so people with a little bit of knowledge actually do a lot of damage if they haven't developed their own spirituality. You know, the point of knowledge is that it can puff you up, but love is what builds you up. And we need to be better students of love than we are just students of knowledge. But a student, yeah, of, yeah go on. Yeah, sorry. No, I, I think you, you're right because, I mean, uh, the very the very purpose of, 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 I mean, the very result of, of, of believing in Jesus Christ and, and knowing Jesus, getting to know Jesus Christ is, is loving, is love, no love each other. At the end of the day, you, had, you don't have to love, you, you have nothing, right? Mm, yeah. Knowledge helps in the way, for example, now the society challenge, challenges your, your beliefs, Right, so sometimes, most of the time, common Christian, you know, common Christian is 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 challenging in in any environment at work, at school, everywhere. And sometimes, if you don't have, you know, that background, so because we can see in Bible, so every, all, so different people believe in different ways. If you see Thomas, he believed after seeing Jesus Christ, you know. Uh, yeah. But but all the other disciples they believe from the beginning, you know. So nowadays it's the same. Some people it's it's, it's more difficult for them to 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 believe. Some of the people, and I think that's most of common Christianity because I mean, you you didn't need much to believe in Christ. In some way, you know, you you just believe. But some of the people need more, maybe more more information. Maybe they've been challenged intellectually. You know, by the the reasons we, uh, provided by faith. So I think knowledge is important to, to you know to provide an answer to any anyone who who asks you for. But also, you know, the uh, as you as you mentioned, yeah, love is 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 like the, the end result of of believing in Christ. Love. Yeah, I think I think that the idea of love. Um, is something that we talk about, but it's not something that we think about how to do it, and that and, and that's part of the problem. Is that is that we're, we're meant to be a society, we're meant to be a people, and and that means that we're meant to that develop a culture, and and this is why you know I'm a big believer in the Benedict option, the idea that Christians need to congregate into geographical areas and live as community rather than having a sprinkling of Christians going to this church and a sprinkling of Christians of uh, going to that church and the other church. But but no, I'm not trying to devalue knowledge. It's What I'm saying is that an identity is more than your doctrines. And at the moment, lots of Christians talk and act and work as if the only thing that matters is your doctrines. And it's not your your an identity in Christ is your doctrines obviously fundamentally important your values I mean we've we've we've, we've we haven't even going to scratch the surface in thinking about what are what is a Christian value system most Christians wouldn't have a clue what virtue ethics are um, it's about your history most Christians don't have any sense of their own history as Christians they still think of themselves as belonging to a particular nation state and they know more about the history of a nation state than they do about the history of the church and it's also about your culture your your societal framework you know what calendar are you working to how do you divide time what are your festivals how do you celebrate you know and and the that's that we need a much broader framework to understand what it is to have a Christian identity than just doctrine. I'm not saying yeah, it isn't doctrine. I'm just saying it's not just doctrine. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, you know. Um, what's your name, bro? Al. It, uh, uh, yeah, Al. Al. I mean, there's a there's a passage in scripture that that your comments made me think of. 
Um, and it is in, um, I think it's in 14. No, actually, it's in 13. It's, um, it's the way of love. And I thought it'd just be worth reading it. If I speak, and 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 this I think is a corrective to so many kinds of churches. So as I read this, I'm going to list the kind of churches that jump into my mind that are being corrected by this passage. It's in one Corinthians thirteen. If I speak in the tongues of men yeah. and of angels, but I do not have love. I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. That's for you Pentecostals. And if I have prophecy and I know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. I think that's a correction to pretty much all of us. If I give away everything I own, and if I give over my body in order to boast, but I do not have love. I receive no benefit. That's a correction to all you sort of social justice Christians and, and the, particularly the civic religion churches. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious. Love does not brag. Now, the thing is, you've got to think about, you know, you've, patience is a virtue. Kindness is a sentiment. Envy is um, a desire. Um you know, these are things that you've got to think about. These are not things that you can just, you know, you, you've got to think, what does it mean to envy? What am I envious of? Where do I need to be patient? How can I be more kind? Love does not brag. That's about your words. Love is not puffed up. For all you intellectual Christians whose who's mind, you know, you look down at all the other Christians because you know more than any of them. Yes, you might know more, but are you puffed up with pride? Love is not rude. That's a correction to me. Love is not self-serving. It is not easily angered or resentful. It is not glad about injustice. And this is one of the things about a correction to all you wimpy soy boy Christians who are willing to turn a blind eye to injustice. That's not love. Injustice is something that you can't be glad about, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. It's an, an energy source for us that that, that is constantly, um, so long as we cultivate it, it's the, the, the place from which we should act. But if there are prophecies, they will be set aside. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be set aside. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But what? But when what's perfect comes, the partial will be set aside. But when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I set aside childish things. And this is this sense of we're meant to grow in our Christian faith. You know, grow in the fullness of our humanity. For now we see in a mirror indirectly, but when we will see face to face, sorry, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. That's the virtue ethics right there, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love, the the. the the framework upon which we Christians are meant to hang everything else that we do is love, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I think lots of Christians are, are, are poor, poor students of love because they go to fellowships that are maybe emphasizing the prosperity gospel, or they're going to fellowships that emphasize works and wonders kind of ministry, or they're going to uh, churches that emphasize the ceremonial and the liturgical and, and we forget the fact that as Christians, the thing that we're meant to be focusing on is is how best to love. Yeah. You know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, Al? definitely. Yeah. It basic, basically, my reflection is starting that in that verse you read earlier. That if, if you haven't got, you haven't, haven't got love, I'm nothing. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to be, at the end, you could be asked if you're, if your actions were directed by, you know, by love, I think that's it's a very, very big reflection on, on Christians. Yeah, yep, yeah, very much yeah. so. 
Very much so. Yeah, and I th- definitely. I think I think wherever possible, unless you go to a, a local fellowship that is an absolute disaster, unless all the local fellowships in your area are an absolute disaster, you should try to go to a local church. And you should try to get to get to know local Christians, you know, and try to cultivate, you know, being a Christian people as much as you can. Anyway, yeah. Al, it was a pleasure to to have you on. I'm going to shift tact briefly. Feel free to jump back in on, on, on the, the next thing that we talk about. But I'm going to move, try and move away from the, the sort of um, rambling that we've had for the last hour and be a bit more disciplined. So thank you very okay. much. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, guys. Hopefully, if Al would like to come back, he's more than welcome. Um, right. What what I'd like to talk about now is a radical question. Um, you know, we we do radical questions every now and then, and and the radical question that I would like to talk about, and and I'm inviting all of you to to come in and comment on it, is this one. It, it is the question of whether we should allow uh, Christians who are doctrinally sound, um, or at least on paper doctrinally sound, who have political views that are incompatible with the Christian faith or moral views that are incompatible with the Christian faith to take on issues of leadership within the fellowship. Now, Oh, what what I, what I mean by this is often when you when you go into a fellowship or when you work for a church, a sensible church will ask you to sign a confession of faith and say, "Do you agree to this confession of faith?" And most churches will use the Nicene Creed, which is pretty much um, what we should be using, really. Um, but they'll ask you, do you believe in, in these things? And and if you say no to any of them, there may be some discussion, uh, depending on what the issue is and how you, your particular slant on it. You, they may let you in, they may not, depending on what you say. Um, but what I'm saying is, I think it's now necessary that every Christian organisation, whether it be a Christian school, a Christian charity, um, a parachurch organization and every Christian fellowship should have should have a similar statement of we need you to accept these things to work for us um, in terms of certain moral questions. And these moral questions would be, what is your definition of marriage? Like, do you accept the Christian definition of marriage as between between being between one man and one woman? Do you accept that there are only two genders, male and female? Also, what is your view of abortion? Like, you know, a Christian view is abortion is unacceptable. Um those are the three that, that come to my mind. And I think it needs to be a very narrow, small list. I don't actually think it would be helpful um, for Christians to have a huge list, though as society develops new issues and new questions, you could always add to this list because you've got to understand all the lists that you find in the Bible. I don't see them as complete closed lists. I think there are things that could be added to those lists. And same with the church as well. It gives a list like the the canon of scripture, but it's not a closed list, which is one of the reasons why I don't have a problem using reformed Catholic or Orthodox canons. Um, So I think there needs to be a, a very narrow set of questions like for instance do you believe in um do you believe in multi-faith worship um that christians should partake in and participate in multi-faith worship to a common god and anyone who answers those questions the wrong way and i think my crowd and, and the people who are watching this know exactly where i stand on all of those questions um should be excluded from all church leadership uh, and all leadership in any Christian organization. And that we Christians actually should even keep a list of people who are ostensibly on the wrong side of the line. And that this is a blacklist that we have in all of our organizations that that excludes certain known individuals from 
leadership within the community um, as errant Christians or, you know, and, and errant Christians rather than, than heretics. And I, I wondered what you guys felt about that, whether you agreed, whether you um, agree, but you think that you would have a different set of questions that you would want to put in there on, on moral um, and ethical questions, whether you disagree, um, whether you would have a broader list, a shorter list. Do you think that the, the, the angle that I've taken is the wrong one? Um, so that's the question that we're going to be talking about. That is the radical question for today. Um, so come in and tell me your perspectives, your point of view. And I, I, I want to stress, guys, like, I mean, join the queue. I'll let you in. Uh, just be patient. Um, if, you, if you're at the back of the queue, I'll try to keep you informed about where you are in the queue. The reason why I say this is because, uh, and I'm going to explain before I let anyone on, so please do be patient if you end up in the studio, um, just waiting in the background. Um, the reason why I think we need to do this is because the reason why Christians keep getting outsmarted by the world is because we are slow to recognize the fact that we are being discipled through politics. You know, we, we think that we go to church and we hold on to Christian doctrine and then we've got a blind spot in the way that our soul is being formed by political movements in the world. And, and then what happens when we join an employer and they put us on um, training within employment that tells us we've got to think about issues in a certain way. That's all discipleship. And every time we watch a sitcom or a program that endorses a certain way of thinking about the world, that's discipleship. When we listen to music that gives us a certain message, that's discipleship. Like, you know, there's lots of songs that talk about love as if it's just a feeling that you feel. It's like a magic feeling. And when it's gone, you don't love anymore. That's a discipleship. And so we end up with Christians who tick all the boxes doctrinally but then undermine what that narrative means by their pastoral decisions and by their, their pastoral teaching. And, you know, we think, and, and I think that Christians need to get wise to this and we need to organize ourselves in a more proactive way um, that allows us to, um, to resist this. Um, so I, I would be interested to know what you guys think. Do you think I've got a good idea? Do you think I've got a bad idea? Do you think that, um, you know, my list is the wrong list? Do you think that someone else can come up with a better list? Uh, I want to let in Sister Malika. How are you doing, Sister? Peace be with you. Oh, oh hi, Bob. <laughs> Peace be with you, Malika. You okay? I don't know how to work this thing. Doesn't matter. You, we can hear you, and you can hear us. So, um, oh, no. <laughs> so, what, what what do you think of the question? Uh, what was what was the question again? <laughs> oh, bless your heart. So, so the question, <laughs> so the question, Malika, is: um, Do should we have, in the same way that we make people sign a confession of faith? to make sure that they believe the right things, should we also have a, a, a very small list of touchstone issues of pastoral lines that we expect someone to keep um, in terms of things like abortion, gender, marriage, um, and that anyone who can't sign up to orthodox traditional values should be excluded, not just from leadership in a church but leadership in any christian organization at all so it, it should be tread at the same level as doctrine oh absolutely okay and and what do you think that that list should be mm. well i mean the list should definitely align with what the bible talks about um a leader should be especially like a pastor or a priest or a teacher <clears throat> yep definitely definitely i think i then, think that I know there's gone there's standards to being like there's certain standards they have to uphold right 
Well, you'd think that, but then you look at what happened with you look at what happened with BLM and the the kind of the the total buying into identitarian politics and the fact that you've got churches that are pushing for um, gay marriage and you've got churches that are asking themselves how they should celebrate someone celebrate someone transitioning gender. Um, I mean, these are real things that are happening in churches. And the reason why that is happening is because we have not guarded the gate on these pastoral questions in the same that we that we guarded the gate on doctrine. And that has mm-hmm. meant that we've allowed people in who are sent intellectually to the doctrine, but who in the rest of their life don't accord to a Christian worldview. Mm-hmm. So that... that, that yeah. Okay, then. Uh, is there anything you want to add to that? Or are um, we done? <laughs> no. Um. Okay. Fair enough. In that case, um, thank you very much uh, for coming on. Uh, nice to hear your voice. And, um, you know, if you, if you come back with it, if you come back with any other ideas, feel free to to jump back in. Okay. Oh, um, I want to tell you. Okay, so I... <laughs> So I was like live on with Sam Shamoon last night. Okay. And um <laughs> and um we got into this topic and um, I wanted to ask you about it but not like publicly. Okay, so um if you want to send me a, a message, I'll put my e- you know my email. Yeah. Yeah. So so send us a message. We're, we're connected on Skype, I think anyway, aren't we? Uh yeah, yeah. So so just drop us a message on Skype and I'll I'll get back to you on that. Okay. All Thanks, right. Bye. God bless you. Peace be with you, sister. God Take bless care. You. Bye. Right, guys. So any any thoughts on this issue? Do you think that the the what what kind of questions would you throw in? What kind of moral questions because or or, and furthermore what what kind of problems have you seen within the church because we have not guarded on this question you know if the scriptures teach us to guard our hearts for it is the wellspring of life well the, the the sort of moral questions are questions that we need to organize on a, 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 an institutional level to protect our identity as christians and and let's be clear right this idea of excluding people because of the the angle that they might take on certain pastoral questions, you know, people might accuse and say, oh, you know, this is just, you know, um, intolerant, et cetera. Um, but liberal progressives are doing this. Let's not pretend or kid ourselves, guys. If you have the wrong view on certain political questions, you can lose your job. If you have the wrong view on certain political questions, you can lose your social media access. You can be cancelled um, as the cancel culture goes. So progressives, you know, being the hypocrites that they are, are not behind the door of excluding you from employment, going after your job, going after your finances, going after your standing in society. So we Christians should not be ashamed or embarrassed by any kind of browbeating or you know finger pointing lecturing um that that could be carried out by these progressives who are doing exactly the same thing to us because we don't have their views so every christian organization should be creating a blacklist of people who are teaching things like you know the acceptability of transgenderism within the Christian lifestyle, uh, supporting gay marriage within the Christian lifestyle, of supporting abortion. And those Christians who are known, who are unrepentant, who have not made a public repentance um, for a public stance in the wrong direction, should be excluded from work in any and every Christian organization. And I I just wanna see what you think about that, guys. So um, let's have a look at what Rob says. Um, would it be scripture to say you can only marry once and not marry a divorcee? 
what measures would you say would be too strict? So, I mean, is this a, yeah. So, I mean, is this a question that should be included? I think that, I, I think those that remarry um, without exceptional circumstance, i.e. like, Obviously, if you remarry because your partner has your, your partner has passed away, then we're we're not talking about that. But if you have divorced and your partner is still alive, then um, th there would there would have to be some really um, there's only very narrow um, measures in which someone could remarry and still be allowed in Christian leadership. And I I would say that if someone has remarried for in an unchristian condition, uh, unrepentedly, then they should certainly be excluded from leadership within a Christian fellowship. Um, whether that would also apply to work in, say, a more secular Christian organization, I don't know. I, I'm, I haven't sort of sat down and thought that far myself, but it's a good question. Um, I would lean to think it would depend how Christian the work is, if you see what I'm saying, or how Christian the organization is. Um, but but certainly those that, you know, there are reasons why you can divorce and remarry if your partner has committed adultery. If you're married to an unbeliever and they choose to leave you, that's one, that's an exception that lots of Christians are not particularly aware of. So if you're married to a, a non-Christian and they leave you, you can you can remarry that's like that that that's not a divorce um you know so um yeah so as christians yeah it's it th there are very few exceptions um that that we have um if the the marriage was invalid to begin with you know like one of the partners is infertile um then then you know that there are a few degrees they're very narrow though um and they'd have to be examined so i don't think it's a bl it would be a blanket ban for any any re a at all but there there would be certainly um heavy restrictions and certainly anyone who divorced because you know the marriage was difficult and then remarried or committed adultery they 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 should not be allowed in christian um, leadership positions doesn't mean that they can't be in a church or in a volunteer say in a Christian organization it just means they can't be in leadership um, they could maybe have a, a position that wasn't considered leadership like receptionist or um, you know <clears throat> somewhere where they don't have a decision-making power but they just facilitate the decisions of others and I think that's really important Precisely because what we have seen over the last 300 years is that Christians have set up these amazing organizations that have done amazing things, but then those organizations have become less and less Christian. And the reason for that is, and you know, the Catholic schools are a perfect example of this, is because they couldn't recruit enough Christians, so they ended up recruiting non-Christians, and that diluted the Christian identity. And, and a perfect example of that, where that got really bad, is in the Church of England itself. They couldn't get enough vicars, so they actually just lowered the standards of, rather than accepting fewer priests to serve larger collections of congregations or just larger congregations they just lowered the bar and allowed more people in to get their numbers up and the result was that they, uh, they the church of england is full of bad vicars full of and and awful bishops who who actually don't even some of them don't even believe the faith um and lots of them have ridiculously liberal um, unchristian views on lots of moral pastoral questions. So, guys, you're, you're making me pull teeth here. Uh, does, is there anyone that wants to come in um, and talk about this? Captain Bloodfire, I love you, bro. I really do. But every time you come onto my chat, this is the only topic I see you talking about. We're not even talking about this today. Like, I, I, I've, I've kicked off and blocked, um, you know, um, Muslims for trolling. Please, bro, don't make me do it to you. Like, stick to the topic, my friend. I'm asking you, please, okay? I'm not going to block you yet, and I'm certainly not going to um, silence you for five minutes, but 
please, bro, behave. Like, just quit with this every time. Um, okay. Political problems that I have experienced in church, such as going to Bible studies and being mocked for wanting to leave the EU. Yeah, now, that's a, a, another good question. So this would be a question for me personally that I think that the church should not have to police and, and a Christian organization should not police. So whether you're pro EU or anti EU isn't something that should decide whether you get to work for a Christian organization or whether you get to be a leader in a church. Um, however, you know, and, and so I, I don't think this would be one of those questions that I think um, needs to be um um, policed because it's a constitutional question about the state and the church exists outside of the state the church is separate from the state the, the christian community was here before any nation state and will be here long after every nation state is a footnote in history including the eu itself but but you know it's a contentious issue and it's a sign i think I, I, I weirdly, I in in my fellowship there was a lot, a lot of um, Brexiteers. I think a lot of I think a lot of church leadership got caught off guard by how many Brexiteers there were with congregations in the UK. I know for anyone outside of um, the UK, this is such a UK specific question issue, but I think. Um, you know, it, it 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 it's one of those questions that I would say falls outside of the list, um, and it certainly is a debating point within the church as it is outside of the church. But it's not a moral question; it, it's more of a constitutional question about a nation state that's not biblical. You know, we happen to live in the times of the nation states, but previous Christians lived in the times of international empires um, and tribal societies. So it's not really a question that 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 is uh, that Christians need to police. I don't think. Um, any other comments connected to this issues, guys? Let's have a look. No, bro. I'm afraid I, I, I'm not. I, I uh, again. You, you say that and it's just too vague. Like, what am I supposed to know? There's crap loads of things happening in South Africa, bro. Like, which particular thing happening in South Africa? South Africa is like the UK. There's a million things happening in South Africa. So, guys, to help me to help you or to help me to to engage with what I'm saying, try to be a bit more specific. Um, I can't read your minds, guys. Um, please bear that in mind. Um I agree with you, and I think that Christian leadership should be in all church schools too, including head teachers. Well, yeah, I, I think here's here's something that I, I think is also relevant to Lent, which is that as Christians, as Christians, we should Christianize our economic lives. If you can, bank with a Christian bank. If you can, work with a Christian employer work in a Christian company, work in a Christian organization. One of the reasons why so many Christian organizations and Christian companies struggle and end up losing their Christian identity, you know, and so many of these great Christian charities have lost their Christian identity is because the Christians didn't work for them. And so they ended up having to employ non-Christians and they ended up employing so many non-Christians that eventually those non-Christians ended up being the leadership. You know, so guys, if you can try to work for a Christian company or a Christian organization or a Christian business, like go be deliberate about being Christian in your economics and be deliberate about being Christian in, in where you send your kids to school and in, in where which businesses you go to and which banks you go to. You know, try to be Christian and disciple your whole life. Um, and, and don't be browbeat about this idea, oh, this is separatist, this is, you know, sectarian, you're, you're, you're being intolerant. The progressives have already demonstrated that they are willing to sack you, cancel you, go after your job, you know, deny you promotion if you don't hold progressive views. So these hypocrites can't exactly lecture us if we start doing what they are doing. 
But the thing is, guys, it, it is actually m more Christian for us. It's more in line for us to do this in our faith than it is for the progressives to do this according to their ideology. Because they are the ones that are saying religious identity doesn't matter, ideological identity doesn't matter. We're all civic citizens of the nation state. That's their ideology. They are the ones that are saying that we're all really just human. But then what they do is they treat different humans differently depending on their beliefs and their values. Whereas we as Christians, we have this idea of the family. We have this idea of the body of Christ. We have this idea of the church. So it's much more consistent with our value system to have solidarity amongst ourselves in how we do politics in how we do economics and so on, how we do um, arts and how we do information sharing, and that includes schools. It's much more Christian for us to solidify around our faith and much more consistent to our faith to do that than it is to adopt the progressive attitude, their, their, their verbalized attitude of not caring about these things, when really they tell us not to care about these things, but they care very much about these things. And there are plenty of Christians who've lost their jobs to prove that. Um, how about pastors who support the Democratic Party in America and their views on abortion? Well, this is my point, guys. So here's the thing, like, to, to talk about this sister, um, I would say if you've got a pastor that supports the Democratic Party, that isn't something that, that should be policed because supporting a political party is connected to a state and it's a, a, a matter that is outside of the church. But if the pastor is, is verbally supporting abortion, then I think they need to be defrocked, to use Catholic terminology, or kicked out or fired, to use maybe Baptist terminology. I don't know how the Baptists talk about this kind of thing. But they, they need to be taken out of their office. They need to be removed. So someone potentially could support the Democratic Party, say, because of questions about social justice in terms of helping the poor you know, finding ways to help the poorest Americans. And that might be the reason why they support the Democratic Party, but then they might be a critic of the Democratic Party because of abortion. So they may criticize, they may be pro-life uh, and, and an activist on pro-life issues while supporting the Democratic Party on questions like, I don't know, redistribution of money to the poorest. And on the question of, of supporting the Democratic Party. I don't think it needs to be policed. But if someone says, I support the Democratic Party, the church should be asking them, well, are you in favor or against abortion? You know, um, and if they are in favor of abortion, then they should be excluded. And I want to be clear, I'm not just talking about in churches. I'm talking about in Christian businesses, in parachurch organizations, in Christian charities. And we, we as Christians should share a list amongst all of our organizations, even if we just do it quietly, that says, right, this person is pro-abortion, this person is pro-gay marriage, this person believes that there's 24 different genders, and these people should be barred, and they should be pushed out of the church, or, or pushed out of any Christian organization in a position of leadership. They could maybe be the receptionist, they could still volunteer, they could still be a member of the congregation, but there shouldn't be any, any question of leadership. Uh, let's look. The problem with the ultra liberal ideologies is their transhumanistic core, isn't it? And transhumanism aims at endless change of human nature. So is tattoos and painted hair transhuman. Um, no, tattoos are not. Tattoos are, 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 as, are as old as time. You know, um, the Picts, who were a native tribe of the Isles of the UK, um, used to go into battle painted in blue paint with tattoos, naked, um, fighting against the Romans. Christian Copts often tattoo a small cross onto their children um, and they'll tattoo it onto their their wrist here. And so lots of Coptic Christians will use a tattoo. It's a way of affirming their Christian identity. So ironically, I'm a Christian who's uh, not against tattoos universally. Um, though 
in in Anglosphere, Anglo Saxon culture, tattoos were often um, uh, looked upon negatively. Um, but the the thing about the progressive ideology is that it asserts the self as God. That's the, that's the God of progressive ideology, the self. And so the self is the highest order, the highest organizing principle, which means that if I feel something, you can't question it. No one can question it. The self is God. So if I feel I'm in the wrong body, no one can argue with me. The, the, the problem with that is then it, it starts to fall into all kinds of um, paradoxical problems, which is that the self has, has, you know, sought to defend the idea of women's rights to break out of the cultural, traditional norms uh, of what women used to do in the sort of 1950s family. And, and they use the arguments of the self as a way of creating this expansion of women's right. And it's not necessarily something that I disagree with, but though I've arrived at those conclusions, a completely different way of getting there. But then when you get then 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 when you've got this group, other group of people that say, I'm in the wrong body, I'm actually a woman, the result is that the self that created this idea of women's sports and, and women's spaces, like women's toilets, suddenly comes into with this idea of men who are now saying that they're women and who then can't be argued against, who then go into women's sport and dominate it and ultimately wipe away the potential for women to, real women, to, um, to excel and to be noted for their sporting achievement because even the most mediocre male athlete, and I don't say this in a pejorative or insulting way, but the most mediocre um, male athlete will still be in the top bracket of female sports. Um, and that means that all those really excellent female sport um, athletes are going to drop down a whole bunch because of of men moving over. That's one example of this paradox, this contradiction. So it's the God of the self that is uh, the problem. And sooner or later, I mean, we've already had a case of it. Um, you'll, you'll get transracialism and that'll create a whole bunch of why are you appropriating my culture concerns? That's the next contradiction that's gonna hit the progressives. You, you're gonna end up with someone saying, well, really, I, I was born in the wrong ethnicity. I feel that I'm a black person. Um, and and then, you know, w when you see someone doing that, you, the, and then you, you got the whole language about cultural appropriation. Well, how are you gonna argue about that? I've already spoke, I, I've spoke to, a, um, a psychologist within the NHS, and we, we had this intellectual debate about transgenderism. Um, she's fully on board with the idea of transgenderism. And, and I talked about transracialism. I used all her arguments to back up transracialism. And she said that she, she agreed that, that transracialism is possible, that someone could identify as being an ethnicity that they're not. Um, so BLM, you know, I wonder what you're going to do when that comes along. Um, so the problem is the God of the progressives is the God of the self. And, and there's no higher authority than the self in the postmodern progressive world. And so it can't be questioned or argued, um, which is why we Christians need to start using this argument of, of our identity and start using that language, that framework, to assert our rights to live as a people by our own doctrines and our own values. Because when we start using the language of the self to identify as Christians and to say it's in too intrinsic to our identity, it, it causes confusion in the mind of the progressives. And the more that they are confused, the more advantage we have in the cultural war. So get busy, brothers. Okay, so it's gonna skip the chat and I'm gonna miss all that you said. Sorry, <clears throat> so let's go back up to the top. So any any other thoughts on this radical question? None of you are, are coming into the chat, so I guess we'll just do it this way instead. Um, actually, I, I, wanna, I wanna change and talk to a different radical question now. And it's, it's one connected to free speech. 
So I think given the advancements of the progressives, um, it is all love, bro. It is all love. I do love you. I really do love you in Christ. Just, 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 if we talk about Catholics, talk about Catholics. But if we're not talking about Catholics, stop getting into debates about Catholics, please. Anyway, so so I want to change to attacked and uh, change uh, the radical question that I want to talk about. So progressives are, are very good at creating cultural expressions of their ideology. And this is why they keep beating us, guys. It's because we have lost the ability to express our identity as a culture. And this is why Muslims get special rights that we don't. Um, you know, lots of us have thought about this question wrong. We think that the, the Muslims have won this special privilege um, because of the fear of the progressives. And certainly that's part of it. But another part of it is the fact that Muslims express their faith as a culture and the multiculturalists can't argue with another culture they just have to create space for it so we need to create a christian culture to win space for ourselves um and and this is one of the ways that we need to engage in the culture war and and a key part of that this culture war is the question around free speech so i think that that Christian businesses and Christian organizations um, should be free speech uh, zones, free speech employers, and they should make it public. And we should create this, this idea that one of the ways that you can sell yourself to potential employees is to say, we are a free speech employer. So, you know, like they've got this, you know, we are a LGTB 2QXYZ safe employer. And they, 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 they advertise the fact that we are positive about this cause or positive about that cause. Well, Christian organizations and Christian companies, particularly Christian companies and, and Christian churches need to say that they are free speech, well, maybe not churches um, for reasons that we might go into, but, but Christian companies and organizations need to say that we are free speech employers and, and posit that as, as a reason to come and work for them. Um, now, what do I mean by this? Like, I mean that not that you should have the right to say whatever you want in work time. That's obviously ridiculous. You can't go into work and start coming out with some kind of babble that's going to cause issues. When you're on work time, you behave like a professional and you don't say the things that your employer doesn't want you to say. That's a given. But what we've got in this culture at the moment is that if you put something on social media that your employer doesn't like, even if you do it in your own time, even if you do it years before you sign a contract with your employer, you can get sacked. And what we need is employers that go, when you're on work time, you'll obviously say the things we want to say and treat our customers like we want you to treat them. Um, so you won't necessarily give your opinions on certain things because we don't want you to because we're paying you to work for us between nine and five. But on your own time, on your own social media accounts that are not connected to work, so not on a work social media account, because that's a work issue, but on your own social media accounts, your private media accounts, you can say what you want, so long as you don't bring it into work. And if someone doesn't like that, they might not like you, but we're not going to sack you for it because we are a free employer. And then those companies that say, look, we are a free speech employer, will attract people that believe in free speech and push away people that don't. And those of us that believe in free speech can then go and work, uh, take our business to free speech employers as a way of solidifying the idea of free speech as a culture. And, and uh, there should be some organization, maybe one of you guys might even pick it up, an organization that will give certification to employers that this is a free speech employer. 
And, and then they can take that certificate and use it in their advertising, boasting about how they are a free speech employer, um, uh, guaranteeing that they are not buying into the candle culture, the woke culture, the progressive culture. Um, and it will offend. You will get targeted by progressives, but it means you'll also be shooting up a flare that believes in free speech can come and support your business. So that's the radical idea. And I'm saying that Christians need to lead the way on that. The reason why I would say that Christians need to lead the way on that is because if free speech down, the gospel is clamped down. And yes, free speech is a double-edged sword. It means obviously that I've insulted. It means our Lord can be insulted. It can be mocked. But where we need the gospel to be free. And we need a world where we can criticize other religions and other belief systems. So that's the radical idea. I'd be interested to know what your thoughts are, guys. I'll release the uh, the link. Tell me what you think. If Are you a business person? Are you someone who owns a business? Do you think that you will add yourself as a free speech employer? Do you think that I've uh, got the framework wrong for my free speech idea? Do you think that an employer should be able to say whatever they want, even inside the workplace? Do you think I'm totally wrong on the idea of free speech employers and that actually you recognize, as I do, that free speech is actually compatible with a truly Christian worldview, that the trade-off is too much and that actually Christians should be against free speech? What, what thoughts, guys, on the question of free speech employers? Let's have a look. Okay, um, Jose, um, forgive me, but that is an on topic, so I'm not going to get too much into it. I'm not sure what you mean by reprobate, to be honest. We're all sinners. Uh, I think that there's definitely some sins that are worse than others. You know, um, someone who smokes weed um, has a problem, but that's as someone who's committing adultery with another man's wife. There are some sins that lead to death, and then there are just some sins that harm your soul, but they don't lead to death. Like, I swear it's a sin, but it's not a mortal sin. Um, you know, blasphemy is is far worse than, than swearing. Um, so, you know, it, it isn't a case that all sins are the same. Um, it's more about the things that touch upon the things that are sacred. So, the church is sacred. So persecuting the church is 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 far worse than someone who is, um, you know, in favor of, um, you know, like so, say supporting the BLM movement. You know, like persecuting the church is is it is is far worse than say someone who's an authoritarian you know, uh, if they're not persecuting the church. Um, but so it's about what touches on what is sacred. Um, if you smoke weed, you're going to be damaging your own body. It's not great for you. But at the same time, it, it isn't the same as someone who goes out and murders. And I think some Christians are really immature to say that all sins are the same. All sins are the same in the sense that they all fall short of the glory of God, but not all sins are the same in terms of their social consequence. And I, I think we have to have a bit more intelligence about the way that we think about it. But that's all I really want to say about it, because we're not really talking about that. <clears throat> so back to the radical question, hopefully. Let's have a look at what people are saying. I think free speech can be a problem. I have a Muslim co-worker who has views and perspectives on several issues, such as women and marriage, and brings up a lot of uncomfortable topics. I think, Sister Mutasa, you are probably from America based upon your last question. Um, and how I envy you Americans. You have no idea how much I envy you Americans. Your constitution is a work of statecraft, um, truly is. And it is something that I only wish we had something like in the UK. We desperately need across Europe someone or some group to breathe uh, life again into this idea of free speech. Free speech definitely can be a problem. And I'm not talking, I, I don't believe in 
absolute free speech in every sphere of society. So I don't believe in free speech in the church. Obviously, I don't. I'm a Christian. You can't have free speech in the church. You cannot have someone in the pulpit denying Christ is God and still allow them to stay in their job. So I don't believe in free speech in every sphere of society. But outside of your employment, outside of the church, outside of organizations, I believe in the free speech of the individual. Um, now, I believe that the, the, the speech of the media is something that, that's more negotiable. I don't believe in, in total free speech for the media, um, unless they're just operating as a platform for other people, private citizens to speak. But if they are speaking with an editorial voice, then I don't believe in free speech for them. I don't believe in free speech organizations, but I do believe in free speech for individuals. And I don't believe that an individual should be punished for the practice of speech if they're doing it in their own time, on their own platforms, using their own publications, and they're not in an or doing it as an organization. I believe in that kind of free speech. Um, and, and I think that's the kind of free speech that we should be advocating and defending. And employers can do something to support that kind of free speech. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Let's see what else have we got. Uh, Yeni Daniel, hey Bob, been looking at your vids for some time now and must say amazing. Do you run any discipleship classes? Yes, I do. So on a Wednesday night for any of you guys that are interested, um, I run a Bible study. Uh, it starts at 1900 hours British Standard Time. That's in the evening here, obviously, on a Wednesday um, until 2030 British Standard Time. Um, anyone can join. I've had people from all over the world come to the classes. Uh, you're all more than welcome. Drop me an email. I'll put my email into the comments. And if you want to come to it, you are more than welcome. Um, it is a discipleship class. It is not a, I, I want to be clear, it's, I said I called it a Bible study, so I've misled you already, sorry. It is a discipleship class. It is not necessarily a Bible study, um, though obviously the Bible and studying the Bible features massively in terms of um, what happens. Um, but sometimes it is discussion about the Christian faith. I would agree, you have the balance between work and personal. I would be happy to go a step further and protect owners who wish to promote the Christian values. Certainly, I think that, <clears throat> I think Christians, I think that there needs to be pushback against the progressives. The uh, progressives, I'll let you in in a second, Captain Canada, I do see you. Um, the, the progressives are active cultural warriors. And one of the reasons why the conservatives lose is because the conservative camp have accepted their place as being just the no group, as just being a group of people that just go, no. They've got no proactive vision for society and they have no way of communicating a conservative culture and this brothers and sisters is where the church can step forward because we can have a conservative culture and we can argue and, and do uh, cultural evangelism and create a cult counter culture that's christian in origin that then conservatives can be drawn into there is a whole group pool of people conservatives waiting to be evangelized. It's an opportunity that we need to strike at. Okay, Captain Canada, I'm going to let you in. So if you want to stop walking around, get your earphones on and sit down. Um, I'm going to bring you in. Um, Captain Canada, you need to be sat down, bro. I can see you walking around with your computer. I'm going to let you in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So when you're ready, let I'll, let me know and I'll, I'll bring you in. So yeah, I think that, that, that there needs and the way to push back is simply to have a positive view about what free speech is and then create laws that support it, sustain it and cultivate it and also punish organizations that don't value free speech. So if you're a company that has progressive values and you're sacking people because they, they have posted something on social media that you don't like, then the government should just say, right, you're not going to win a contract. And you watch how quickly Google and Amazon and all of these groups suddenly start towing the line of free speech. 
if the governments were to say, right, well, I'm sorry, you've been promoting intoler, you've been promoting values that are against free speech. You've been treating your workforce in this way. We're not going to give you a contract. We're going to restrict your access to the market, and then companies will suddenly fi- rediscover their love for free speech. So the government plays a role in this for sure. Okay, in comes Captain Canada. Da 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 da. How are you, bro? <laughs> I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, brother Bob. I think we are, need to have a th- so, someone with such a cool name needs to have a theme tune. <laughs> Appreciate that, man. Appreciate that. Um, I just want right. to say, well, love your stuff as always. Um, what you're talking about, free speech, and what people need to realize. I don't know if they're realizing is that. I think looking at it from the perspective of we've got it, we'll have the freedom to then share the gospel, and then we have the ability to also, as you say, do polemics and like apologetics on um without fearing of someone you know losing their jobs or christian bakeries having a particular standard it, it all lines up eventually if i have the freedom to say what i see fit yes it does mean that people will criticize the faith but it also means i can come back against them and not fear my boss could watch this video and possibly fire me so i think ultimately it, it it's a win for us christians yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it, the, the first thing that we have to be honest about is that free speech is not compatible with, uh, is not a value to be practiced among the Christian community. It's not a free for all in the church. You can't come into church and start insulting our Lord, start insulting his mother, start insulting the apostles or the prophets or blaspheming against God or, or, or saying that you're doing something in the name of God when it's abhorrent. You know, so we're not freedom of speech people, but within civic society, we're not a, a free speech community, but within civic society, in terms of civic law, we get more out of promoting and supporting free speech than we do than 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 by not, you know. And and what we need to do is we need to change this. We need to we need to push against this progressive culture that are, is meaning that lots of Christians are losing their jobs and being discriminated against in the West. And, and I just want to say that's obviously nothing compared to the outright persecution of our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. You know, we've we've got an even bigger fight to fight on their behalf. But part of that is is winning the right to speak freely about the fact that across the entire Islamic world, Every single Muslim society, without exception, discriminates or persecutes against Christians. And if I can't say that publicly, then how can I help my brothers and sisters? You know, and we need to be able we need to be able to say what needs to be said. But I accept that we 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 can't live in a society where people can say what they want when they're under employment. But you're only under a contract for a certain number of hours every day, and and it's wrong that businesses see their contract as having some um, some muzzle over your mouth outside of your contracted hours, or even before you ever signed a contract, which I think is ridiculous. Mm. I think that idea that you provided of, you know, which would encourage people that are, that support the idea where if I'm off the clock in my own time, I can say what I see fit. That will encourage a lot. That will encourage a lot, a lot of like-minded people, hopefully Christians, as well, we'll be coming together. That's actually a really good idea. I've never thought of it from that perspective. I'm going to be taking that away myself. And even in my personal Bible study today, I'm going to share these things because I think that's really important. Yeah. And and this is the thing. It's, it's about Christians learning to express their values culturally. This is how we go back onto the offensive. We Christians have been on the defensive for 300 years. But since the Enlightenment, we've been losing. And it's time to get back on the offensive. And, the, and, and right now is the perfect time because progressive liberalism is falling into its paradoxes right now. It's falling mm-hmm. into its own hypocrisies right now to the point that they can't even hide it anymore. You know, it's, it, it's like it, it's so obvious they don't even bother to hide it. So, so right now is the perfect opportunity for Christians to push back. But the way that we've got to do it is through our culture and through our organizations. And it, we've got to consolidate. And that means consolidate our institutions to express Christian values. And that includes, I'm not just talking about church fellowships. I'm talking about church chari- Christian charities, Christian, Christian-owned businesses. 
and someone, some some better man or woman than me, needs to start this organisation that says we are going to certify that this employer is a free speech employer with a commitment in policy that outside of work time they will uphold the individual's right to freedom of speech. When that idea takes off, you watch you watch the village people start to pack when they find that employers and the economy is creating a counter economy with counter values to the, the village elites um, values. And it will be a great day when that happens. But, you know, I hope this idea catches on and I want full credits when it does, but when it catches on, it will be a great step forward for us, you know? It's like- I'm, I'm gonna I'm have not, I'm gonna have that for my business, trust me. I'm gonna I'm put thanks, a, a Peter, but, right there underneath. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's brilliant. So, guys, um, is there anyone else that wants to come in on, on this question or this idea? Thank you so much, Captain Canada. Next time I want to see you in a Marvel style uh, <laughs> outfit with some theme tune. I, you know, we, there was a Captain America and then there was a Captain UK. Did you know there was a Captain Britain? No. <laughs> Yeah, 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 it was one of the most undersold Marvel comics ever, but there was a Captain Britain. He had a staff and he used to drink tea. Uh, I never heard of that dude. I'll have to check him out. Yeah. <laughs> check him out. Check him out. Not as strong as Santa Claus, but there you go. That's a discussion for another day. All right. Take care. God Appreciate bless, bro. Take care. Any other co questions on the idea of a a company's a Christian organization saying that we are positive free speech employers, i.e. We're not giving you license to say whatever you want when you're on contract time, but we're not going to judge you based upon what you said before you signed a contract. And outside of work hours, so long as you're not using any social media connected to the company or the organization, we won't hold you to account for what you say there. Obviously, so long as it's not breaking the law. I mean, if uh, that, that's a different matter entirely. If you're saying something criminal, then, then um, you know, the employer can act and, and I wouldn't see that as breaching this principle. Um, but I, I think any other questions or comments on the idea, guys, I've shared the link. Um, if you want to come on and state your thing, let's have a look. Uh, bless her, Nada, always doing a great job in, in posting these things up. There's two ways to support me, guys. If you feel like supporting me, you feel like I'm doing a good job, you can either join me here on Patreon um, or you can join me here on the blog. Both of these have content that I put up, um, you know, that's specific. So there's stuff on the blog that you don't get at Patreon, there's stuff on Patreon that you don't get on the blog. Um, though Patreon takes a bigger cut than the blog does in terms of what I end up getting. And this is for those of you that value the work that I'm doing. If you want to be a, a covenant partner and you want to help me to do this full time because currently I'm only doing it two days a week this is the way to do it I need people to stand with me so that I can um, go full time I do have a, a standing committee that overlooks the finances every quarter I have to release all the statements to them so that they can see how much money I'm getting in how much money I'm drawing down they've placed a cap on how much money I can draw down they've also you know, they've also allowed me um, an expenses allowance. And if I use expenses, I have to show them all the receipts. So I am being held financially accountable um, and that gets signed off. And then I sort out my standing with the tax man because I've got to go sole trader with the tax man. Then um, th there will be a professional accountant that will come in and look at all the books. That's in the process of getting organized. So, you know, but for me to go full time and to be an evangelist full time, then these are the ways to do it. And I, I do appreciate and I want to say thank you to everyone who's already a covenant partner, everyone who's committed to supporting me on a monthly basis. You guys um, of what have facilitated me to do this in a much healthier way than when I've done it for the last three years, all in my voluntary time. And it was consuming my entire life. Um, and now I'm able to organize my life in a much better way that means it's more sustainable. And, you know, we're, we're seeing fruit and we're seeing battles, um, you know, it, the people are coming to Christ because of this. And um, I'm dealing with people who are struggling in their faith um, and people who are close to coming to faith. 
Um, and the, the more time I have to commit to this, the more I can do, though I, I've got to stress that like what you see online it will, is only a part of it. That there's a lot that I do um, off camera, um, I, you know, Skype conversation, telephone conversations, email correspondence. And, you know, at times before lockdown, I used to meet up with people, go for coffees with them, talk to them off camera. Um, you know, and these things go on. So if you feel that you, that I'm doing something worthy of your support and you want to get involved, that's a very quick way to help. And this is another one. Please do like, share and subscribe. That helps me so much. And thank you, Nada. She's such a faithful sister, uh, really doing a lot to try and help Christian apologists to network and work together. So keep her in your prayers. Um, Anyway, uh, back to the question of free speech, or are we all done? I think we're probably all done, to be fair. Uh, I've done this for two hours, rambling on. Right, guys, um, so only only 500 people would be needed. I, to, to my maths, actually what I need are um, 100 people who are able to donate £20 a month on a monthly basis, or 200 people able to donate £10 a month on a monthly basis. And that will mean that I am able to hit the amount that my steering group have given to me as my monthly wage. They've said that I can have a wage of £2,000 a month, um, which may sound a lot um, if you don't understand how expensive London is, but London is a very expensive place. So actually it's a modest amount. It's a decent amount for a single bloke, basically. It means that I can live a modestly comfortable life, but not it's not excessive by any means. And then I'm allowed £500 in expenses above that, but and, and then obviously um, I get that back, um, but I gotta show all the receipts for that. So that, that's basically the amount, guys. Um, anything that I get above that, let's imagine a situation where 400 people all decide to give £20 a month, then obviously I'm gonna get a lot more than 2,000. Well, that, that extra money would sit in the tanks, but I'm still only allowed to draw down my monthly wage. I'm not allowed to draw down more than my monthly wage. Um, and the steering group checks to make sure that that is what I'm doing. And then obviously, you know, if I was being unfaithful, any one of them could then go public and go, you know, I'm part of the steering group. Um, and, and, and challenge me on this. So I, I am being held accountable. Um, right, there you go, guys. Um, God bless you and peace be with you. Let us end with a prayer like we started. Please do join me on Twitter. Um, um, I, if Nada would be so kind as to share the Twitter account uh, in the chat, if you've got a chance, that would be lovely. Um, okay. Blessed are all they that fear the Lord and walk in his ways, for thou shalt eat the labours of thine hands. O well is thee, and happy shalt thou be. Thy wife shall be as the fruitful vine upon the walls of thine house, thy children like the olive branches round about thy table. Lo, thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord from out of Zion shall so bless thee, that thou shalt see Jerusalem in prosperity all thy life long. Yea, that thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace upon Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Have a lovely evening, guys. God bless you all. And for your Lenten battle tomorrow, uh, commit yourself once again to this holy campaign and uh, have a blessed um, Lenten fast. <laughs>